Base is dropped on a new round of soccer down here. It's a wall pass Wednesday. So we know what that means, that pretty much anything and everything is on the table, whatever you want to talk about. Uh, doesn't matter what it is and could be anything having to do with the Christmas season, could be you know soccer, could be the games from yesterday. The game from yesterday could be the game today. We'll get into all of that. Uh, morning, Sean. And uh, good to see you yesterday at Elsewhere. Good to see a lot of folks at Elsewhere yesterday. And... Uh, See that 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 Lionel Messi dude. He, he's uh, he's he's I you know he, he has his moments and uh, Croatia found out about uh, about all that yesterday. Like I said, we'll get into that. Uh, we've got news with Atlanta United. George Campbell making his way to CF Montreal Impact soon to be probably hopefully maybe perhaps it uh, won't be. And the world is worse for it. Come on, Joey, be better. <laughs> I know. Come on, man. Uh, Not so much better that you won't give us nine hundred thousand dollars for a homegrown, but be better about your logo and your name. Yeah. You had something beautiful and you threw it away for the sake of marketing. Not even good marketing. Exactly. You threw it away. You then had to backpedal, but you didn't backpedal all the way. You backpedaled like a busted first round pick. You got into your backpedal, then you tripped over your own feet, and all of a sudden, JJ Stokes is running sixty yards. There you go. See. You can't do that. You you can't backtrack as a uh, open your hips, damn it. Yeah. Open your hips, Joey. Open your hips, Joey. See now that's a t shirt. We we gotta get we gotta get Hudson on that now. Open your hips, Joey. And people will sit there and go, What is he talking about? Well then you'll find out what you're talking well, nobody about. Nobody well, then somebody didn't have to do four corners, Jill, so they threw up. Mm-hmm. And go into Coleman Coliseum in the, the heat of summer and go uh, around the edges of the basketball court with the garbage cans right there at each corner. Dude, the worst one was we used to do baseball practice in the basketball gym if it was raining outside. You ever had a coach hit fungos off of a hardwood at you? It's terrifying. Yeah. That thing was fun. It was yeah. awful. Like it's a bad hop. No ball is gonna hop. Like we don't we don't play. This isn't Pasapalo. We're not in Finland. <laughs> Please stop bouncing balls off the hardwood at me. Yes. Nothing like dropping a Pesapalo reference early in the morning. Pesapalo uh, is a great game if you ever get a chance to look it up on YouTube. Yes. It's Finnish, it's Finnish baseball. Um, and this is going to take over the open kickoff. I don't care. Um, okay. Pesapalo, it's very similar to baseball, except like there's no formal pitcher. The pitcher stands at home plate with you and throws the ball straight up in the air. And then as it comes down, you have to hit it. But you cannot Sammy Sosa this thing and yeet it into the next county because it's a foul ball if it goes too far before it hits the ground. It has to hit the ground in play. But, it hit, but once it hits the ground in play, then you get to run to first base, which is only about half a country mile. Uh, then you make your way to second and then third, and then you get to try and score. But it's damn near impossible to score. Because it's it's such a long it's it's longer than ninety feet, it's an incredibly long run and it's an incredibly complicated game. As the batter is there, the rest of his team stands in a semicircle behind him, holding up different colored cards to indicate different strategies. It's an amazing experience to watch it with zero context. What the blue hell did we just talk about? Pesa Paolo, it's finished baseball. Um, it's a very weird sport. That's yeah. You and I will go uh, over this one day. Um, I, I know I understand about 80% of it, but I spent a like, man, look, when I worked in radio, when I worked in traffic during those night shifts where there's nothing going on, like you've made your rounds calls, you've updated everything. Uh, G dot's website was functioning so I could keep up with everything you get some downtime and you start learning about obscure sports and then you start watching Pesa Paolo replays just to kind of learn how it's played. <laughs> Nick, that was the opening kickoff brought to us by our friends at kickoff coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com where 
Jared is teaching us about Finnish baseball. Pesa Paolo this morning. I'm sorry, what? Exactly. It's finished. I'm going to send – okay, I'm going to send you both a link for when you're bored. Nick has two kids. He might not be bored uh, ever in his life. Uh, <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Nick only stops moving to sleep, much much like a shark that doesn't actually have to move to keep the water going over the gills. Um, but yeah, I'll send y'all both. I'll send everybody a link because I expect Jason to get genuinely upset at me for introducing weird random things. Um, this is finished baseball. I'll, I'll send it. I'll send it to you later. But it's uh, P E S S O P P E S O P A L L O Pesa Palo. Pesa Palo. And this is Finnish, right? So yes. I mean, is it like is it like they are they serving like pickled shark instead of hot dogs and and, and fries and popcorn and whatnot? I don't know. I don't like it's like it's like the national sport of Finland, I think. But it's not as big. It's it's kind of like the whole like baseball's America's pastime, but it's not the most popular sport in America. But I think Pesapalo is like the national sport of Finland on unof- like officially, but it's not like you know, more it's Finland. More people are probably going out uh, you know, cross country skiing or biathloning or curling or playing hockey. Uh-huh. Or doing strongman competitions. I mean, this is the land of uh this is the land of Yoko. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, like, it just seems to me that, it, you know, you're in a country that has fantastic skiing conditions. Uh, you know, I, I would just think that there's something better to be done than indoor, indoor, uh, baseball. Uh, indoor was, baseball. It's uh, played outdoor, too. Okay, okay, well, here's the thing. The Swedes were very productive with their time, right? They invented, like, Swedish black metal. They perfected the art of, you know, dark, super ultra, you know, graviton-inspired death metal. They did something very productive with their time. This does not seem like a very productive use of time, in my opinion. It's not. <laughs> I, I just I have questions about the Finns now. I, I really would like to have conversations. If the Finnish embassy could reach out to me, maybe we could do some sort of tourist exchange program. And, Send me uh, over there. I will. I yeah. want to. I, I would love to go play this game, but I also have this. I also have a a goal in life to try and play and experience as many obscure, weird sports as I can before I die. I think there's a show there. I no think question. there's a show. I think I, there I, is. we we could figure this out. No doubt. I'll reach out to the tourism uh, board of, of Finland and see if we can if we can set this up. Look like we have two American yokels uh, who are just the weirdest guys. Like one's very tall, one's very short. Uh, we have a very normal uh, gentleman as well who doesn't eat, like he only eats, uh, you know, pre He only drinks Mountain Dew. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and consumes Mountain Dew. He's going to come along with us. and Plus a crew. Yeah, and, yeah, and we will. Uh, yeah, and Jason's going to come along. He'll he's there to make fun of us. It's a, it's a crew of four, and we will, you know, all you have to do is get us across the Atlantic. We'll figure out. We'll make igloos or something, some like snow fortress. We'll figure and, the rest out. Yeah, we'll figure the rest out. There's something to do here. Okay. Yeah. yeah so uh, Michael Head, I think, pretty much sums up everybody. Uh, so glad he was here live when the opening kickoff went off the rails to the max. I'm so glad Nick jumped in just to get like Nick probably jumped in here thinking we're going to discuss Lionel Messi putting Croatia in hell mm-hmm. uh, or we're going to discuss, you know, oh, George yeah. Campbell or the Grant Wall News. Like there's a lot of things to discuss. Nope. Finish baseball. No. <laughs> this is like the, the, you know, when, when we would do, you know, soccer over there and, ha- and you know, discuss like, you know, uh, nuclear death bunnies and yeah. Vietnamese soccer league and, and, you know, the second division Mongolian league. Yeah. So it, yeah, that's just... still out there for, to, for discussion. But I think that what we have determined is that the, the critical mass of opening kickoff and wall pass Wednesday got us to Pesapaya. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> Traditional, traditionally, the way that Wall Pass Wednesday is, and then you combine that with opening kickoff, and then it's like the old, uh, the old black and white video that we used to see in the movies that would they would insert with the train, with the train wreck just kind of going off the edge of, oh, yeah. the, of the the poorly constructed bridge, and the and the train just kind of just goes over the side. That yep. that that's uh, that was opening kickoff this morning. That, see, that's what happens: critical mass of opening kickoff and Wall Pass Wednesday. 
Yeah, and we do have like legitimate things to talk about. Go ahead and go ahead we and uh, do. we do go ahead and plug your uh, yeah, plug do, kickoff. We do the tag. We pay the bill. Yeah, pay the bill. There's the opening kickoff. Rogers by our friends at Kickoff Coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com, Kickoff Coffee CO, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Use the code soccer down here 15. You get 15% off of your purchase. When it comes to everything, kickoff coffee. They in turn take 10% reinvested into the youth game, kickoff coffee, and kickoffcoffeeco.com. All right. So that's your opening kickoff. Now, uh, news came out a little before the show started this morning. Uh, Celine Gounder appeared on, uh, Dr. Celine Gounder appeared on CBS this morning. And she announced that uh, Grant Wall's death resulted from a weakness in an artery wall, and it was an aortic aneurysm. So uh, aortic aneurysm, what happened, a rupture in the ascending aorta, which carries oxygenated blood from the heart, and the autopsy was performed uh, in, in New York. And so that, that is the official news, ascending aorta catastrophic rupture aortic aneurysm is how grant wall was taken from us at the age of 49 so that came out this morning uh from uh tv appearances plus uh something uh a statement that was released on grant wall substack and uh, i still i still have that i still subscribe to grant wall substack and you kind of go back and you can see uh just the the process of everything that he covered there in in uh, in the host nation uh, for the tournament that we've been talking about that is now down to its final three so uh, we now have the official news. Uh, still didn't make it any better, but at least we now know it's uh, aortic aneurysm, a rupture in the ascending aorta for Grant Wall, taken from us at the age of 49. So, uh, all right. So let's get into yesterday. Uh, yesterday was Argentina and Croatia. Once again, thanks to everybody that came out to uh, elsewhere to hang out with us. And, you know, this Lionel Messi dude, uh, really put some folks in in the spin cycle yesterday, and it was uh, yeah, Nick. <laughs> you run out of superlatives sometimes with guys, you know. Yeah. So when I'm just uh, we didn't have Pele. Are the, are, the, are the trees near the Nicolifi uh, yeah, office? It, okay? it, are are the ants revolting? No, what we have is uh, we have a, a neighbor, our dear neighbor, is p- installing above ground uh, gardening beds. Ah. The way he said dear neighbor carried such vitriol. No, actually, she's amazing. I will say this. Okay. She's amazing. Okay. Uh, the, the, that's yeah, that's yeah. wonderful to hear. Yeah, no, she's amazing. The, the, the issue here is I'm trying to figure out like uh, if what I can say without putting myself into some sort of like legal jeopardy here. Um, Not just so, uh, what you can do is do it factually. Yeah. Do it so factually. Are, are you, here's the issue is that she loves gardening, right? There is a large slope that my house sits atop of and the water runs downhill all the way through her yard, turning her yard into sort of a, a, a bit of a, you know, the Oki Finoki and, that obviously is not good for gardening. And so I, it's beyond my property line. There's not much I can do about it without sinking significant funds into some massive landscaping stuff. And so she has taken it upon herself to install French drains and uh, an above ground gardening center. And apparently they're bringing in uh, like two or three crews to get this job done. They're bringing in some heavy equipment and whatnot. And so, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's what's happening this morning. Okay. Right and early here in the, the uh, kingdom of Dunwoody. So, <laughs> so yeah. But as far as uh, the, the soccer stuff yesterday, uh, yeah, that guy's pretty good, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> I mean, pretty, you know, we, we, did, we did not have Pele – in 4K, right? Which which stinks. Um, we do have a lot of video on Maradona. Mm-hmm. Uh, we saw how Maradona could change games on a whim. Uh, you know, we've seen what Ronaldo could do at his prime. I have never seen anything like this, where not only can a, a, a gentleman change everything alone but then somehow manages to lift everyone else around him to such an absurd degree. And the team completely be bought in on his security. Anyone comes near Messi, 
and they're like, you know, they're they're <laughs> automatically there's three players coming in like, okay, hold up, hold up, hold up, wait, 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 what are you doing? Don't touch them, you know, don't come near them, you know. But it, it, it's, you know, watching it, and there's a great documentary on HBO about Maradona where they discuss him dragging Napoli to essentially the the Champions League uh, trophy, and which is absurd. Napoli had no business contending for that. But what you see right now with, with Messi is, and the difference between the two, is that where Maradona could singularly change things by himself, this he Messi is the rising tide that lifts all the boats. And I can only imagine what Argentina would be without him in the lineup. It, 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 the, the, what he's doing is comical. It, it shouldn't happen. It shouldn't <laughs> exist. If if we wrote a movie about this, the studio would kick it back and be like, this is some Netflix low budget mess. This is not something we're sinking $200 million into the making because the plot line is so stupid that it audiences will not buy it. And and then, you know, of course, we have that, that big win and the video that starts uh, leaking out of Argentina of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in the streets yelling and screaming. We have a boilers uh, waving flags and dancing yeah. and singing. It, it, look, it's, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. absolutely nuts. I've never seen anything like this. Yeah. I, I, I'm 40. I'm 42. I, I've been around for a minute. I've never seen anything like this. And I don't get caught up in the, the Messi Ronaldo, Messi Ronaldo. Be, 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 be. Look, I, I think the conversation's done. Yeah, and and that that doesn't say that, regardless of what you think of Ronaldo the human being, Ronaldo the player at one point was a one man nuclear weapon, right? He was the he could even the odds in just about any situation. But I watched Ronaldo come up. I, I'm old enough where I watched Ronaldo come up, you know, and and explode onto the scene. But I've also watched the fall off. And that has to be factored in. You cannot just measure peaks. And, and because if we're talking just peak only, I don't think there's anyone who's beaten Maradona. But you have to factor in the downfall of Maradona as well. Cocaine, being chased out of Naples by the uh, the Camorra. Uh, you know, you have to factor in the fact that Pele was essentially held hostage in Brazil uh, by the government. He wasn't allowed to leave. So we, we, we will never know what he could have done in Europe. You know, we only know what he did within the national team, uh, the national team scope. But we to watch Messi go from what he was in his early days to what he's doing now and not see a discernible fall off. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely stupid. <laughs> it's absolutely nuts. So and yeah, it is going to be pretty cool that, uh, you know, Almada is going to be there to, to witness this, you know, Um any ask you know Italy in 2006 what happens to any player on the roster uh, if you're when your team makes the World Cup final uh, it's you know everyone's transfer valuation jumps about mm-hmm. <laughs> a pretty mm-hmm. substantial amount just because they were there to witness a, a moment that uh, the entire world is watching. Rick's so, got added to that bag, brother. Now I'm t- I'm, t- I'm telling you. So <laughs> I don't know, guys. I've never seen anything like this. Any any. any uh, Attempts for me to further uh, throw words into this uh, <laughs> salad blend would be a, 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 an injustice. Uh, yeah, I mean, Jarrett Rack came in and he goes, the guy he beat to set up the third goal has a family, and his family is a shame. <laughs> the thing with Messi <clears throat> is we talked about this. Um, we talked about this when we went over the Gio Reyna stuff the other day. Um that I'm always fascinated with guys who just they answer the call when they have the world thrust upon their shoulders. <clears throat> we talk about LeBron, we talk about even Bryce Harper, who you know, when you're a teenager and someone's like, That guy's the future, he's gonna do all of these things, and they don't let the the weight of the universe destroy them. Mm-hmm. Somehow. Yeah. Somehow. But the fact that Messi and, and and it's what it was, it's a thing we do in soccer, especially we're like, oh, he's uh, that man's now thirty something, like he's now thirty 
you know, 37 years old. He's ancient. He might as well. He might die tomorrow. Yeah, Luca Modric. Whereas, whereas the rest of us, yeah, Luca, Luca especially, like, with the rest of us, like, oh, 37, he got a good long life ahead of him. He's doing well. But, man, Messi's just, like, <laughs> he's just getting the job done over and over. And if you wa- if you read any of the stuff out of Argentina from the journalists of this concept of like we know we've asked so much of you for all of these years, do you have one more in you? Do you have one more bit of brilliance in you? The man's been carrying that nation's pride on his back for over a decade and a half at this point, and he just keeps on doing it. And look, I know he hasn't won a World Cup. It's it's. You can't one man show your way to a World Cup title, ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the time. Right. If there's too much that goes into it, but the fact that he has shouldered this this entire nation and this entire soccer culture so efficiently is it is still mind boggling to me and infinitely impressive. You you, you look at what we're seeing here, Michael Head comes in and he says, I guess it's way too much to ask, but could the final just be Messi's last match? I want to remember him as this version of him, not 40-year-old Messi getting nutmegged in Foxborough. I mean, I mean, there's, I mean you've, you've still got the one year left. At, well, I, you yeah. know, you have the, the negotiation, I think, that's happening after the World Cup with PSG to continue there. Uh, it, you know, if, 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 if Argentina wins and Messi goes out, you know, with his last large trophy being uh, a World Cup, does he take pause and sit there and go, you know, okay, I think I've done everything. I'm out. And do we, you know, and then does he come over to, uh, you know, Intermos FC and, and, you know, play a year? Is he done? I mean, or does he do the fade? That's the thing. We don't, we don't, we don't know how he's wired. And what competition is left for him if he was to win this weekend? But uh, to to see, and, and this is the difference, you know, you know, Nick, we were getting into the difference between uh, CR thirty seven and and Messi, and we did it yesterday at, at elsewhere, and it's the difference between playing with someone and having to and 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 having to play for someone. Uh, I think is the the proper preposition to use here because with Messi, everyone around him understands the deal. And I want to get into the, the walking part too. They understand that you need Messi for moments. You, you need him to carry you over the, you need, you need him to carry you over the top. Everyone around Messi will sit there and they will do their damnedest to do their job when you get those opportunities where Messi can take advantage of the situation like he did yesterday and put Croatia in the, in the collective spin cycle for Cristiano Ronaldo, you're having, you're having to force his involvement for the overall success of Portugal. He's an anchor. He weighs you down. It is a black hole when it comes to his involvement. Messi is the guy that's going to take you over the top, Cristiano Ronaldo, is the guy that restricts your movement. I mean, Cristiano Ronaldo is the ultimate restrictor plate. It's like it's like going to it's like going to Talladega, mm-hmm. and you're racing, and Cristiano Ronaldo's there. Where other places there ain't no restrictor plate, and I think that that's the difference when you see these two. There's a difference in playing with someone and having to play for someone or or around someone, and, and we've seen that this tournament. Yeah, I'll, I'll use, and I know why everyone hates when people do this, but it's probably the best comparison that I can think of, and that is Carmelo Anthony in his prime was a guy who could put up 40 points a night in the NBA. Um, he could will a team to win on his own, but he was the ball stopper. That you, It didn't matter what team he was playing on when, and no matter how the offense moved, the ball was going to end up in Carmelo Anthony's hands and stop there. Like it wasn't going anywhere else. And you know, in, in, in the early days of Kobe, it was very similar until Kobe learned to trust his teammates and start distributing more. But in the end with, with Ronaldo, Ronaldo was 
a player that you had to get the ball into the attacking third for him to be able to do anything. You have to force that ball through. You have to, you know, he's not creating magic from the half line forward. In the attacking third, probably one of the best to ever do it. Mm-hmm. But for Messi, you're talking about a guy who can affect the game like from the six forward, which is ob- obscene that you have one guy that, hey, look, our six gets the ball from uh, from the center back, and uh, and is now all you have to do is get it to this one guy, and he's going to unlock everything else. It doesn't matter if you put you know, two guys on him, three guys, four guys. We've actually physically watched teams, observably watched teams put four dudes around Lionel Messi. It means nothing. Mm-hmm. And because he understands, you know, the ball is not – going to just simply leave my foot and go into the back of the net. We can really blow this thing open. If I find the simple pass, if I find a simple pass, what is simple for him and really, you know, you know, small G God level for everyone else, uh, everything else unlocks. And, you know, we can thank his time at Barcelona for that, you know, where it was, okay, I can, I can be more of a facilitator and have just as much, if not more, of an outcome on the game than just being the one guy who, it's a funnel. The ball ends up with me no matter what. And, you know, I, yeah, I, I think that, you know, soccer for good, I, I think that Messi, I, in my opinion, I think it's happened um, to, to pull, you know, to get out of the shadow of Maradona. Maradona was this mercurial talent that... Um, had he not discovered copious amounts of cocaine and, uh, and, and the mob that maybe we see something very different and maybe we are having a different conversation, but history's history. I, I, to me, that's the difference between Ronaldo and Messi is that his ability and understanding that I can, from any place on the field, influence the outcome of the game by simply you know, doing what is necessary, not forcing something, but just doing what's necessary in that moment. I'm going to make a simple pass. I'm going to weave through three guys. It doesn't matter. It's just going to get done. And, you know, with Neymar, Neymar gets touched. He launches like uh, the Saturn V rocket um, and grabbing his ankles and his spleen and whatever else. He's, uh, st- he's still he's still turning. Uh, he's still turning over. It, exactly. Right. Um, you know, Ronaldo for a while, um, you know, if you even like kind of exhaled in his general direction would launch himself down. I, I watched Messi get absolutely butchered in La Liga. I mean, butchered. And when in Champions League, my God in heaven, they're, they're, you know, they're Artac and all these other teams, and they, they are just stabbing at his ankles. And he's taking hit after hit after hit after hit, and he still keeps going. He's still weaving through people. It, it, to me, that's – it's like how – like no one else is doing this but him. Everyone else is like, nope, I'm going to take the cheap foul. I'll drop. I'll get the free kick, and well, we'll be in a dangerous position. I understand the logic behind it. But Messi's taking – Hit after hit after hit. I'm going to drive this ball down to the attacking third. And just when you think I'm going to do something really stupid, I'm going to dink it out to this guy that you've completely ignored who's going to put the ball in the back of the net. Right? How you? How you? you can't, how you can't stop that? Mm-mm. You can't. No. And, and right, Jason, He's he's been absolutely getting hacked at this World Cup too. <laughs> and, and it doesn't matter. It the doesn't thing he, matter. The thing he does, and I think it's underrated. We talk about it in football a lot is he minimizes that contact. He's like a little run. He's like a running back that is so good at not taking the big hit. He's going to get hacked. But how often do we see Messi just get cleaned the absolute hell out versus, Hey, here comes a big tackle. And he just turns it into a glancing blow. And I know those can build up over time. Barry Sanders. Yeah. He just, he, he, he doesn't get destroyed. Like they, they don't, they, they can't, they, they don't get clean hits on him. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you can't, you can't get a solid flush blow on him, and it's, he's always bouncing off. He's bouncing off of the attempt. He's bouncing off the tackle, like we always used to see Barry Sanders do. It, it's not just that though. It's, it's, it, it, that is very true. He minimizes the contact, and 
he minimizes the contact and it, it's it's there you have guys who you know like Emmett like Emmett Smith is another person who was able to kind of minimize that contact but the both of the ways that that Emmett and Barry could beat you is was through their multiplicity the things that they could do they could catch the ball they could run the ball they could and Messi's taking these hits mm. Messi's taking this punishment and I think that's what endears him so much to his teammates is they see it they see him you know his ankles after the game right they see him getting cleated where you know if you read all the stories about Messi uh, uh through the years especially with some of his media appearances and some of the fundraiser stuff uh Messi and friends it, look it ain't all glowing stories man no you know like the guy has an edge to him but on the field, you never saw that edge. You saw kind of like this like little football playing machine that, you know, operated at one level. And in this tournament, he's channeling, he has channeled something. This aggressiveness, this this sort of, you know, will uh, of, of the greats to, to kind of haul Argentina to this this final. And you if you look at the reverence of his teammates, mm-hmm. they get it. Right. I mean, they are, they are understanding. This is like when Jordan came out of retirement, when they were trying to coach Jordan out of retirement and Pippen, you know, infamously wore the Jordans on the, on the sideline and held up the, the Jordan, the bottom of the Jordan to the camera and, and, you know, waved his finger, like, come back, come back. You know, you saw the reverence, even for people who didn't like him, they knew what Jordan could do. Right. And the difference that he would make. I, I feel like we, Argentina and we do this so often, especially in today's media, where we don't appreciate the great things until it's gone yeah. and we can't have it. I feel like finally we are we are witnessing where the media, the the fan bases, minus England, are all looking at this and recognizing what's happening. Where it's all like, this is something that's really great and really stupid that's happening right now. We're not going to see this again, probably for a very, very, very long time. And, it, and that's the difference with Ronaldo. You saw, you know, even from the training camp when he showed up after his Piers Morgan interview, sure. uh, that, was, that was a pretty frosty reception that he got. And you saw that, you know, on the bench, it, it, it wasn't exactly warm, cozy feelings there. And you saw whenever Ronaldo was not on the field for Portugal, they played wonderfully. Yeah, it's amazing what happens. Yeah, and when he came on, different animal. But with Argentina, you see the reverence, you see the love. Um, you know, they know what they have in, in, in this. So it's it's something that's absolutely absurd. Can we put the walking thing to rest, Jarrett? Yeah, because it, it was it was a thing that like Stu and John just wanted to harp on the entire game. And yeah, we we yeah, he he's an oh he's not sprinting, he, he's not Brooks Linden sprinting up and down the field the entire game. Yeah, I believe that. He's he's getting old. He conserves himself because he can, because the team is built to be okay with that. And it works. Like you talked about when they played better when Ronaldo was on the bench. Uh, I think Jason and Jess talked about it the other night. Now I thought I liked the way they explained it that, you know, when, when Ronaldo was on at the end of that game against Morocco, it seemed like they were more concerned. The younger players are more concerned with playing to Ronaldo. Yeah. Then just play. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. Just play. But this way this is set up in our, with in Argentina, like the up until like the first the first goal, the first uh, two goals really. I mean it's it's guys making plays who don't have a ten on the back of their shirt. Now, granted, he still impacts the game. He still impacts every play. I get it, but I feel like they know they can play off of him they don't he it, the ball does not have to touch his feet to as a direct assist or even a hockey assist for it to be something they can go forward with they have the ability and the comfort that yes he is a game changer he is electric we saw it in the third goal when he put a man on a <laughs> on a milk cart like he toyed with one of the better defenders in this tournament it was hilarious it was it was Go back and watch it, and it's like Messi's in his head with him, knowing when I do this, you're going to react this way, which means you'll be at a disadvantage for your second move to be this, so that's what I'm going to do. 
it was like he was sitting in his brain with him oh, he's and playing knowing yes yeah he, he knew what his next move he knew what the defender's move would be and then did exactly what the defender was not in position to handle and just tormented the poor man but those first two goals like you don't have to go through Messi. you have you know brilliant players who you had, you had Enzo and, and Julian Alvarez? Yes, you have Julian Alvarez who is out there just lighting things on fire at will. They don't have to go through Messi, and they ha- and it's set up to where he, yeah he can walk. They're gonna be okay. Uh, Nick, we talked about this a bit yesterday. Some of that Italian blood that runs through that Argentine team Ooh. showed the hell up on the defensive side of the ball. Taliafico, man. Oh my God. Yes. Ooh. Talia Fico's tackles yesterday, I, I think, were an absolute difference maker for Argentina. That, that Croatia, any pass that went beyond, uh, that went beyond like ten yards uh, on Talia Fico's side, were just snuffed out. I mean, like he had his angles perfect. Uh, he had, his anticipation was absolutely spot on. It was very tough challenges, very clean challenges. And I'm talking about old school, I'm flying in and cleaning you out challenges. And they were clean, they were crisp. It caused immediate uh, transitional play opportunities for Argentina. It, it, it was something where that esprit de corps on that back line is something very, very special right now. And I think it all stems from their keeper uh, and and the madman that he is. Deep room. Debut, but you have something very, very special in that back line. And I'm, I'm, you know, as far as the walking goes with Messi, it, it, a lot of that I think goes into old school American soccer culture, which is, you know, if you read some of the books on soccer, it, it's it kind of gets really wild that like they even get into the religious aspect of uh, you know more Protestant based countries value work rate. Um, you know, more of the Catholic based countries, uh, they get into the more flair and it, it, there's like all this data to back it. It's really weird. But uh, one way I'll put it is if you, uh, if you ever listen to a Floyd Mayweather fight called in England versus called in the U S yeah, where the announcers are in the U S are like, and Mayweather defensive, He's dodging the punch. He's a, and everybody's like, oh, it's so boring. But if you listen to the English broadcast, it's like, masterful defending. Oh, he's doing It's incredible. Like, it, it's the value system is different. And, we're, I, and as long as we have these old school soccer heads here in the U.S. that are basing their calls around physical, you know, the, the physical work rate and you know, oh, he's not running and he's not, uh, you know, he's not pressing at the moment. And uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Look, I, I watched as Zlatan came into, uh, you know, came back to AC Milan and Milan was a pressing team at the time. And Zlatan would not press and people, you know, here some Milan fan stateside were like, he's not even pressing, man. What's he doing in there? It's like, no. They figured out how to do it, at, you know, where somebody else took that responsibility at a certain time, and then Zlatan would hang back. Uh, you know, with with Messi, Messi is going to be your facilitator. He's going to be running at three, four, five dudes at a time. I don't want you wasting your energy chasing a backline, dude. Hang out here, chill, get your mentals right, and whenever we get you the ball, baby, work your magic. But. Uh, I'm sorry that the American broadcast team didn't see this. And maybe I'm way out of my depth in saying it, but they need to shut the hell up and enjoy the show because that, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 I don't, you know, not to go Kenny powers there, but it, it's, it just seems to me they have no idea what they're talking about. And there, there's moments like that. If you have a conversation with anyone and it's a topic that you know about, there's going to be some bit of esoteric, information there that is going to betray the person who's faking that they know what they're talking about. The fake will be given away in the esoteric and time and time and time again, the American announced teams are giving away the fact that they are limited in knowledge. They are limited in vision because they, and it's not, I don't think it's their fault. I think it's except for the fact that they didn't bother to expand their views of the game 
outside of the narrow American scope because they're trying to appeal to an American audience. They don't feel the need to necessarily expand it. I don't know. I'm not trying to get in their head. But what I see and what I hear, it's people who don't bother to expand their vision and say, okay, why is he not running? As opposed to pointing out he's not running. There's, those are two very different things to talk about. And with that, I'm going to shut up. Okay. Uh, hour number two, we'll get into the preview of uh, Friends and Morocco. Uh, we're uh, waiting. We're efforting if uh, Dylan Butler, who is hip deep in high school basketball this time of year, and uh, we will see if Dylan can join us for his normal time slot at 10 o'clock. Uh, one other thing I wanted to catch up with you guys about here in hour number one, George Campbell. Uh, CF Montreal uh, announced it acquired George Campbell from Atlanta United yesterday in exchange for a general allocation amount of 400023 200024 plus a conditional general allocation amount of up to 300000 Atlanta will keep a percentage if the player is transferred. Three seasons, 21-year-old defender, 36 regular season games, 22 starts, 2,151 minutes played, two games for the U-20s, making his debut September 5, 2019. So uh, probably the performance metrics are what would give you the extra 300000 But uh, Jarrett, George Campbell off to CF Montreal. Yeah, <clears throat> um, I'll get over it. I'm still sad. Um, I'm still sad because I'm a huge George Campbell fan. I really like what his potential can be, but he does have to play, and it's going to be a very busy back line in 2023. Mm -hmm. Miles Robinson's going to be coming back off of that Achilles. Look, he has a lot to prove. That Achilles injury really screwed up what was a very straight path for him, which was – have a good 2022, play at the World Cup and play well, and then cash in on a move to Europe. Mm -hmm. Well, now that timeline's been changed a bit. I want to see what uh, how his body bounces back. It was a, it was, Achilles injuries are weird, man. They're tough to come back from. And I want to see what he's got physically uh, to do it. Uh, it sounds like uh, Air Force One is going to be back as well. You've got Alan Franco still in the fold. Who I, I look as much as he got as much as Alan Franco when he made mistakes. He made mistakes in the worst possible moment, the worst possible time. They weren't a ton of mistakes, but they were always high magnitude. I thought he played really well at the end of the year. Um, Alan Franco was fine at the end of the year. If he's involved in the fold too, that's two veterans along with the guy who. I mean, if Brad Guzan's not back, is Miles getting the armband? Because I feel like Miles might be that guy for the armband. Yeah. Um, and then on top of that, you have Noah Cobb coming as well. Right. Who we've watched, and I don't know how many other ways to explain to people that Noah Cobb is built different. Um, he is an insanely talented kid who is much more composed and wise than he has any right to be at his age. And cannot his physical yet. Yes, his and his physical skill set is really stupid. Um, he's much faster than you think he is. He's much more athletic than you think he is. He's going to need minutes too. I don't know how those minutes will shake out, but George Campbell needs minutes to find that to find that ceiling. Mm -hmm. I really wanted them to be here, but if there's somewhere else and it benefits him, then so be it. I can swallow that pill. Let's see how he does. Let's see how it. Uh, let's see how it unfolds for him. Uh, at the end of the day, though, you did get nine hundred, you know, six hundred thousand with it, with escalators. So up to nine hundred thousand for George Campbell, which for a homegrown player, it's a damn good bit of business within the league, within Monopoly Money, MLS, Calvin Ball. Yeah, and you know, Nick, you look at what we're seeing here, and it was. If, if you want to look at it, frankly, it was a numbers game and George needed to play regularly to continue to grow. And I think that yeah, to Jared's point, I think it speaks to what they're seeing in Noah Cobb and what they have on hand, even if Miles isn't available for you on match day one. I'm going to cut a, a little promo here for a moment. Um, Proceed. Yeah. Look, one, uh, you know, it, Jared, I think you're completely justified in your, in your sadness, 
uh, you know, this it's, is it's somebody... balancing. It's balancing emotion versus logic. It, no, it's, I, it's, I, and it's I acknowledge fine. that. But, but this is an emotional game. We can't just look at things like we're Mister Spock through through all things. You know, it is logic, Captain. Okay, yeah, great. But at the same time, we get invested in these players, right? And for anyone who is wondering about, well, you know, who's Noah Cobb? Da, da, da. Well, that, all you're doing is you're telling me you haven't been listening to Jared underscore Smith for a very long time. Because if there's anyone out there who understands what's coming through the pipeline at Atlanta United. And, and you know, when people have questions about who is this player, who is that player, what can they do? How do they fit into this system? My God, how are we going to replace player X who got transferred here or there or whatever? All you're telling me is you're not listening to Jarrett Smith whenever he talks about the, the twos. Because this man lives it, he breathes it, he's involved with it, he's at the games, he's doing the interviews. Uh, you know, while, while, while Jason and John are, are, are up there uh, covering the game, better than anybody else at, in, at, at that level in the business. Jarrett's down there covering it just as well at the field level, in the locker rooms, and you need to be tuning in and listening to him because he can tell you what's next. And, and instead of going out and buying this guy or that guy or whatever, and I love Air Force One. This is not a, a cut at Air Force One at all, but it is a cut at anybody who says that this team doesn't know what they're doing from a talent replacement perspective on that back line because they are developing player after player after player who can come in from that pipeline and suit up for the first team. And if you want to know where it's coming next, you're going to be listening to Jarrett Smith. And if you're not listening to Jarrett Smith, you're listening to people who don't know what they're talking about. And so if you want to go listen to somebody with tarot cards, some Miss Cleo ass people who are out there uh, throwing uh, you know, monkey poop at a wall to see what sticks, I can tell you, have fun with that, but you're listening to some jabronis. You want to listen to the real thing, the real man, you're going to be listening to Jarrett underscore Smith when it comes to that talent pipeline. And with that, I'm dropping the mic because it's all business from there. Get the 600K, get the escalators. I wish the best to George Campbell. He busted his butt when he was asked to, but the man knows who's coming up next. That's all I'm saying. Also, ATO using the prospects on Twitter. Uh, I don't even. I don't even. I don't, he and I haven't even met, or she and I haven't even. We have not even met. I don't think. Um, they're also a great pickup on this stuff because they keep tabs on the U15s and U17s really well in terms of results. Um, that if 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 you grow tired of me, that is a brilliant source for those kids to see what's coming as well. You too can know about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Our large attacking son, Daniel Sabatu, mm-hmm. who played against Aberdeen in that friendly, but who had two goals in the uh, in uh, in the uh, UP, uh, NPSL uh, playoffs before we go mm-hmm. in the semifinal. Uh, mm-hmm. Sabatu, very much like uh, comparisons aren't fair ever, um, but like kind of has a little bit of Jackson Conway in that. That is a very large-bodied human being at that age who needs to de- who needs to like grow into it and develop and learn to use his strength, but has a lot of really fun qualities. And you also, I'm sure, know just to uh, that we meet every Wednesday at the Church of Johnny Vial, who <laughs> Aberdeen fans went from man, this guy falls down a lot. What are we doing here? To the end of that game, we're like, hey, y'all want to loan him out? He- <laughs> you, you, he's got a home if you want to loan him out. They also wanted Noah Cobb. They're like, hey, that 37 is really good. Yeah, mm-hmm. no kidding. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks. Yeah, thanks for the reminder. You can't have him. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know what? I have been a proponent for a year. I know a couple of people in the, uh, on the, in the chat have as well, I believe, um, that I, I think that Jackson Conway to Aberdeen would not be a bad move if he's not going to get time here. Right. Maybe he does. Maybe this is the year uh, where he comes in and, you know, from the jump gets the opportunity to be the number two striker and to fight for time. But I, I if he, he uh, Jackson Conway was born in Leeds. Uh, so you have the passport part of it under control. I would not have a problem at all if you if Jackson Conway got a chance to go to Scotland, because I think he would do really well there. He is physical and strong enough to handle it but he's also talented enough on the ball to really cause problems. Uh-huh. That, that would be an interesting play. And, uh, I mean, hey, Aberdeen Aberdeen got the look at Johnny Vial. That would be, that would be rather interesting to see how, uh, how that plays out. But, uh, 
who, who else in MLS is doing this? Who else in MLS? There are very few academies, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, Philly, uh, Dallas. Yeah. So Philly, D- Philly, Dallas, yep. Seattle. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I'm trying to think. Jared, am I missing anybody? Philly, Dallas, and Seattle. Uh, oh, Red Bulls. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, right, well, I mean, their first team success has been. Uh, yeah, say, but, but the, the, late, con- but... the con the concept of working your way up yes. through an academy system to a first team. Yes. Uh, we've seen the success in Philly. We've seen the success in Seattle. Seen mm-hmm. it in Dallas to uh, degrees because of uh, you know guys like Ricardo Pepe that work their way through the system and get sold on and moved. Uh, mm-hmm. And then, you know, yeah, Red, Red Bull's success is something that needs to be uh, paired with it. But you, you still do have that ladder. Yeah. Uh, and how many teams are there in MLS? Do we know? Uh, we're pushing 30, I believe. Oh, okay. yeah, 29, oh, okay. I think, with uh, St. Uh, Louis City SC. Uh, it seems to me that that's a very small group that is, has really embraced that, uh, that pipeline process. Less than twenty percent, yes, yeah. sir, and not and even fewer that that embrace that process and have them stars above the crest. Yes, yeah. and so that that Venn diagram, sir, is very small. Yes, when it comes to that, indeed. Uh, let's see, uh, Emilio asking about uh, Cisneros. Yeah, don't know. The purchase option was declined. You know, you could pick him up for another loan, as Jason Nick says. But uh, but once again, that's one of the questions of the off season is the striker position and. How you how you want to address it? I love Ronaldo Cisneros for his work rate. Mm-hmm. I thought he worked his absolute ass off when he was here. Um, I think if you're not in a situation where you're scrambling and you have a whole off season to look, I think if you're looking to bring in another uh, number two, uh, I think there are other options to consider. Yes. Oh, and uh, by the way, this was uh, I'm guessing this is Sofa Score numbers. Uh, going between uh, Messi and Ronaldo, it was just posted in our production chat. Uh, Messi's numbers, uh, courtesy of No Context Footy, 8.2 against Saudi Arabia, 8.4 against Mexico, 8.7 against Poland, 8.5 in the last day of the group stage, uh, 9.6 in round number against the Netherlands, a 9.6 against the Netherlands. And then an 8.4 against Croatia. So 8.5 Australia, 8.7 Poland, 8.4 Mexico, 8.2 Saudi Arabia. Uh, And uh, comparing CR37's numbers, a 5.1 against South Korea, 6.3 against Uruguay, 6.2 against Ghana. And uh, I give the the folks at No Context Footy a lot of credit because his his score against Switzerland was an empty chair. That's what no that, context. That, that graphic is cold blooded. <laughs> graphic is very cold. It's a it's a chair, a plane, and a TV screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not wrong. It, it's it's not wrong, is well, it? Here's the thing: Ronaldo is the best physical player, I think, to ever play the game physically. Mm-hmm. That, that I don't think there's anybody who is massage gun to prove it. Yeah, who is more physically built to play this game than him, right? But as any of us who are in our 40s know, the body fades before the mind does. Uh And where the strength is gets showcased when those failings start to happen. And when the body starts to fail and the mind is still sharp, you can still be productive, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, Tom Brady's in his 40s. The mind is still incredibly oh, sharp. Oh, he went one year too long. And and but but he he comparatively speaking, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, Matt Ryan is is younger than Brady, thirty seven, yeah, right. And and I would say Brady's having a better year than Matt Ryan. Yeah. And and so the the mind is still there for Messi and how he sees the game. Like oh. the, the that the vision is there, the mind is there. We have to hope the body holds up for one more game, but you know, with Ronaldo, the, the the body just starts to fail. And these young kids, man, they are the level of fitness and nutrition that's happening now is just absurd. Mm-hmm. The in, in the way that they can prepare these kids for play is just absolutely insane. And you know, 
And people are catching up, man. I'm just saying. Yeah, I mean, it's like when you know when uh, Tiger went away from the PGA Tour, and then you had Rory come in. You had the younger golfers who weren't intimidated by Tiger Woods anymore. Right. And right. you know you're you're seeing that with uh, CR37. You're seeing it with Tom Brady when he doesn't get an offensive line and he doesn't have uh, healthy skill position players, and he's spending more time uh, on his tuchus at the age of 45 than. Uh, you know, playing a sport than he would be normally, uh, you know, doing other things. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's what you're staring at here. But uh, you, you look at Lionel Messi and it's just absolutely insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, but once again, it goes back to that idea of understanding what someone can do and playing with that individual instead mm-hmm. of having to play for an individual like you're having to do when you have to integrate CR37 into play and that's what you know that's what you're staring at here and and the differences uh, of only needing to turn the engine over when you need to turn the engine over and you're not having to idle you know you can just sit and idle for a little bit Mm -hmm. sit there and you sit there and you know turn the ignition off when the 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 the, uh, the yellow flag is out you sit there and you turn the ignition off save the gas a little bit then when you need to have it on the straightaway then you turn the ignition back on and and it's 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 gorgeous to watch at points uh, the point, the point that's asked by Joe Boston, well, welcome back, Joe. Good to see you about Atlanta United. Do we have a number one striker right now? That's one of the questions of the office no. is how you handle it. No, yeah. It, look, uh, as, as we get older and the injuries mount and we try to recover from those injuries, injuries take time to recover physically alone. Mentally, it's even more so. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not easy when you are a prime athlete and you are in a position where you're, you're having to, you know, you've been the focal point of an attack that was very successful. And then the injury happens and suddenly that's not the case. Then it's, 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 you know, mentally you have to overcome the fear of, am I going to be able to, to get back to where I was, my next contract's depending on it. Right. Um, am I going to be, you know, is the team going to, you know, give me time to, to do that? You know, will another team sign me for the, the kind of money I'm making now? Uh, am I, am I, you know, do I keep playing? Do I retire? All of these things happen. Every, all these big time injuries across the board, not just Joseph Martinez, but across the board. You know, anytime these big time injuries happen. And so, you know, the, the question is going, you know, he, you'll have moments mm-hmm. where you think you have it back. I mean, his fantastic, uh, <clears throat> you know, was it the scissor kick goal was, was, right. you know, was, well, is alone is like, whoa, wow, could he be back? You know, and then the next game, you know, you go out and you, you have a clunker and you're like, okay, crap, am I, can I replicate this? And it, the cycle starts back over again. And so, the farther he gets from the injury or the further he gets from the injury, rather the, the, the more that should iron out now, whether or not his body cooperates is going to be a completely different animal. And he may need to go somewhere that has a better system to support a lone striker up top, as opposed to, Hey, we're going to press and we're going to work. And we're, you know, everybody on the front line is going to be moving at this particular pace and speed with regularity sometimes that it just doesn't it's just not the fit anymore i mean randall cunningham when he was with the with the eagles was the one man run it like he was the human joystick doing everything Uh and then the Eagles said nah this is not a good fit anymore and he went to minnesota randall cunningham did and he put on one of the greatest offensive performances (laughs) in league history Uh, that offense was cartoonishly stupid but they took the change of scenery to make that happen, right? The Eagles ended up being better long-term. The Vikings uh, had a window where they were extraordinarily competitive as a result. It's not a win-lose. Sometimes it's a win-win. And so, you know, I don't know if the future for Martinez is here. Right. If, if it is, I don't think it's at a DP salary mm-hmm. because they have to get people around him to, to help make that situation better but i do i think he has the ability to 
you know, to play in this league? Absolutely. I think I would be stupid if I said no. Um, but it, there are only three people who know what's going on inside of Joseph's knee. Joseph, his agent, and the doctor. Mm-hmm. The end. Anyone else who claims that they have knowledge of what's going on outside of uh, a medical, a trained medical professional is, you know, either you're, you're talking to one of those three <laughs> yeah. or yeah, you have inside Intel or yeah, you have inside Intel or you're guessing. Right. But uh, you know, and, and no, I don't think that it's, it is a, a, a G I mean, I don't know with the geo Burhalter thing. And I think that's a good question. The, the, the difference for me is, Half of the issue with the Geo Burhalter situation is Geo's youth not allowing himself to to look at things through a more ma- mature lens, which is which is okay. I it, I'm gonna make my I'm not gonna cry and whine and moan. Yes, Burhalter said something extraordinarily stupid, which is I'm not gonna factor into this World Cup. That's asinine to say that. It's his right as a manager, but it's asinine because you never know how injuries shake out. You never know how card situations shake out. You know, Burhalter should have been like, hey, look, man, I'm not going to start you right away, but, you know, keep the powder dry. Keep busting your ass because when the time comes, baby, you're going to do magic, right? Those are two very different messages than, Mm -hmm. you know, than, hey, look, uh, you're not going to factor. Okay, so sit and watch and shut up, you know. With Joseph... Joseph has to overcome his own challenges, which is the injury, right? right. The injury, it, it, he has to overcome that and, and the, the sort of insecurities that come with that. And that's not saying Joseph is an insecure man. That's a, a, an adult human who is looking at the sand of the hourglass starting to run a bit low at performing at a certain level. That insecurity can creep up on anyone, not just joseph but he has to struggle with that then he has to struggle with the team embracing a system that is more physically demanding perhaps than than what he would be asked to do if the team still ran like a three five two or something yeah you know or ran like a hey look we're gonna we're not pressing per se you know we're gonna we're gonna hang back we're gonna absorb some pressure recapture the ball cycle and attack right so you know it's very different things. There are a lot of ingredients that go into this cocktail that we're dealing with right now, which is the Joseph and the Atlanta United situation. Uh, you know, I, I, and the thing is, is that, well, my, and, and Michael, I don't know if Atlanta United would necessarily take a bath on the trade. If we are, if we are looking at a situation where it's a trade, somebody is going to come in a team that, wants to make a splash that is probably a non-traditional player in, in, at the, in the upper echelon of the league who wants to make a splash and say, Hey, look, we, we have a guy who is a MVP a golden boo winner. Uh, you know, we're bringing him in and yes, there's some injury history, but we think he's over it. We think he's ready to go. He's hungry. And yeah. And we, we took a significant risk and investment on making that happen. But you know, if he comes back, I don't believe if he comes back, it's not going to be as a DP. I don't know. Right. Think. Yeah. I, I just don't think that that, that the team would necessarily make that move. Now, whether Joseph and his agent agree to a, a number that can be bought down, I don't know. But once again, you're talking about the, the, I'll use the word, the, the ego of a star athlete who is, who, who feels that they are still impenetrable and immortal where I've done all of this stuff and you're relying on the, the body of work. Hey, I've done all of this stuff. Therefore I feel like I am worthy of X amount. I'm still worthy of that. And that's the, the, the yin and yang here that you're dealing with. You have uh, you have a, a business that is looking at things from a business perspective mm-hmm. And an athlete who is looking at it from a business perspective, because they are their own business. Uh, you know, I'm not a businessman. I'm a business man. Mm-hmm. And, and so you have these dueling businesses trying to figure out how uh, to either come up with some kind of a, a an economic compromise or that's not going to happen. And you have a team that's going to, you know, a guy who feels that his self-worth can be better examined elsewhere 
or a team that sits there and says maybe you should go and find another place to to have your 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 idea of your worth you know plugged into your system yeah and 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 that's you know players typically want to be paid in one of two ways either reward me for what i've done Mm -hmm. or you know reward me for my potential right right that's that's the typically the one of the two ways um you know i think joseph has the right to say pay me for what i've done reward mm-hmm. me for being for you know helping this team get to where they are and so i think that's that's fine and atlanta united has a right to say uh no, <laughs> we're not going to pay you for what you've done. We're very grateful yeah. for what you've done. However, from a business perspective, in a cap league, mm-hmm. we can't do that. Now, right. if this was Syria, great, no problem. Yep, we'll get you your money. You can write out your contract. Uh, you may get less playing time. Uh, you know, as we as we've fully embraced this uh, the system that we're using. But in a cap league, you cannot afford you economic luxuries. That. No, you can't do that. Not in a cap league. I mean, the Patriots won all the Super Bowls not just because they had, you know, having Brady, uh, the best quarterback of all time, helps, but they cut players a year early rather mm-hmm. than a year late. Right. And they didn't allow themselves to get into a situation like the New Orleans Saints Oof. where they are in cap hell for the foreseeable 40, future. $40 million over right now. Right. And, and when you look at what Atlanta, what the Falcons have done, uh, where, you know, they they are middling team this year, but if you look at next year, they're looking at like seventy million in cap space before the cap gets elevated from uh, you know from the year over year from the from the profit from the revenue sharing where the cap gets raised, Atlanta could have 70, 80 million under the cap, right? Mm-hmm. They're in an infinitely better position because they made very tough decisions to let legends go earlier than the fan base wanted. Right. Why are we getting rid of Julio? Julio, oh my God, Julio is a, you know, why are we getting, you know, they're a chunk of the fan base who were completely okay with getting rid of Matt Ryan, but there was also people who are like, oh, this is, we are letting, uh, you know, our franchise QB go. Oh my God. And have it. Atlanta's in a much better cap position to be competitive faster than if they had held on to all this talent for a long period of time and extended and extended and extended like the Saints did. And in any cap league, you can get yourself in a very bad situation very quickly with these guaranteed contracts if you keep extending people who don't necessarily need to be extended at that level. Yeah, and, uh, you know, Nick, you can look at uh, the conversation that we're having Mm -hmm. in the Twitch pitch about uh, DPs and keeping players around. When, When you have, and this is universal, when you have an individual who doesn't want to be here, then it, you know, and you have an administration. And like I said, I'm taking Atlanta United out of the discussion. This yeah. is this is in general. Mm-hmm. When you have when you have a disagreement between front office and star player, and it is an untenable situation, then it's best to try to find a way so both parties can sit there and shake hands. We had a good run and, and move on instead of sitting sitting there and having. Uh, in a cap league, once again, reminder, an individual that you're probably not going to, you know, you're not going to have at a hundred percent or what have you, it's, it's counterintuitive and counterproductive to have that relationship continue. So that's why, you know, you have the, the discussions about any kind of guy who's unhappy. It's like, okay, let's try to find a place that uh, the, he can be happy. And so I think that that's, that's the process that you're looking at here. It's like you're trying to find somebody a good home when you have a disagreement about an appraisal. Well, and keep in mind that how you treat people going out the door is important, uh, especially for agents, right? So agents are going to look and they're going to, you know, as the, as the players, very rarely are players, um, you know, doing deep dives on, you know, how organizations and things like that, that that'll happen more is like they do the visit Mm -hmm. and, you know, but the agent's going to sit there and be like, Hey, look, uh, we see how this 
team treats legends, right? Uh, they, you know, this, this, you don't want this in your life. Or they say, hey, look, this team's all about business. They're, they're, you know, they're trying to get to where they're going. Uh, this is something that for the short term and possibly long term could be a great move for you. Agents pay attention to that stuff. Now, you know, it's going to be with Joseph, I think, something where he understands his role in the community and the fan base. I think he understands it all too well, and I think his agent does as well. But will he rework a deal? I don't think he will. Right. Um, it goes to the self-worth argument. that we made. Yeah, I've, I've interacted with his agent uh, in, and before, and he doesn't seem like the guy who's exactly open to compromise. So, uh, which is what an agent, that's how an agent should be. Uh-huh. Um, so I, I think the buyout is probably the most likely option, um, you know, in, unless something dramatic and, and extraordinary happens between now and decision day on that. So. Right. Yeah, and so and and so that is something that Major League Soccer franchises can go to mm-hmm. as uh, as a league entity because remember that the players are under contract to the league. Correct. And so as a as a league property or a, a league contract, you can do that one time buyout, and then both parties move on. You shake hands. You know, sorry we couldn't come up with an agreement. Okay, and we, we saw it with the LA Galaxy a couple of years ago with mm-hmm. uh, with uh, with Geo. So. That there are there are directions, and then you you move on. So uh, that's the the uh, discussion about Joseph this morning. Unless you guys want to keep talking about it, because that's what we're here for on uh, every day of the week, not just the wall past Wednesday. Uh, Michael and uh, you know, and once again, Hasechu is another uh, decision that the front office is going to have to look at. So there there are folks that you're going to be looking at with contracts. But, you know, at the same time, what you want to do in any contract, you want to make sure that you have, and this is, I'm speaking at it from a business standpoint, you want to make sure that you have an asset under your control Mm -hmm. for any kind of future pursuit, any kind of future idea that you may want to have. You don't want to lose an individual on a free. That, that is throwing money away. So if you sign someone, you know, with a year left on their deal or whatever, you're still making sure that you can kind of control or have some control in the conversation if an athlete right. wants to move on. It, it is it is about making sure that you don't just completely and totally set money on fire and lose somebody that you've invested all this money and time in and lose them for free. So keep that in mind as well. Well, it, it, you know, when it comes to when it, when it comes to players like Josetu, I and I and you know Michael, I understand. I I get it. You know the there's there's pushback on the Josetu, uh, you know extension, but I, I think I think he was a you know, I think he did the the job that was required of him. Now, we can more than disagree on that, and that's fine. I think that's the whole point of a show like this mm-hmm. is that you know people out there have a different opinion than what we have, and you know that's. You know, you know, even on the show, we may disagree. Yeah. Um, you know, I know there, there are times that, that, you know, me and Jason and Jared and John may disagree on a particular aspect on how we view a situation. Oh, and we trade haymakers about. We, we do. Trade. Yeah, we do. Um, you know, the, the issue that I would have is that the discussion around the midfield play and the manager and all all of that is that if you and this is a Pep Guardiola thing and I'm not a, a you know uh, I'm not a Pep fanboy but uh, you know I acknowledge I acknowledge him <laughs> right yeah. and 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 his and his level of uh, of the greatness and 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 you know but what Pep says is my job as the manager is to put a system in place that gets the ball from our goal all the way down to the opponent's goal Mm-hmm. And at that point, the talent that we've paid significant money for puts it in the back of the net, right? If Joseph is 100% this past year, if Joseph is firing on all cylinders it, it, through the very quick mental highlight, imagine, if you would, how many 
balls are going in the back of the net. If if we have prime Joseph on the receiving end of those attacks. And I think that the conversations that we would be having surrounding the midfield would be very different if you know, if uh, if Ronaldo Cisneros is uh, is performing consistently at a high level, if Joseph Martinez is performing at highly at a very consistent level, I think a lot of these extension deals would look very different. And again, that's something we could disagree on, but. Um, you know, and yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Hyman's still here. Uh, you know, the injury bug has found him and mm-hmm. has set up residence. So I think it's going to be an interesting conversation, uh, you know, regarding him as well. There's a lot of talent on the team. And I think that, you know, what's going to happen with, uh, you know, with Almada when Almada comes back from the World Cup, you know, how long does he get? Because you have the January window right there. Mm-hmm. And and how long before some team in Europe says, "Hey, look, this this kid right here, um, yeah, we, we're willing to offer some stupid money for him." I think it's a matter of time, um, and certainly the summer window will be there. But you know, it, it's there's a lot of talent there. I, I think that you're missing a key component, which is a consistent, steady striker, and right. that is extraordinarily hard to find. <laughs> which is, you know, it, there are certain positions in different sports where it is just extraordinarily difficult to find someone who is very successful in the role. A star striker is one of them because they're typically mercurial individuals, people who, you know, it can go through hot and cold streaks and they're very temperamental. Just give me the damn ball, just like star wide receivers and, yeah. and, and so forth. So, you know, this year's going to be very, very interesting for Atlanta United. You have a different, you have a, a guy who is a firm believer in process in Garth Lagerway. Mm-hmm. Um, you have, you know, I think finally a bit of uh, a bit of stability within the coaching perspective. Uh, and you know, I understand there are people who may have said, you know, Gonzo doesn't need to be here and he needs to go. I'm sorry that that's how you turn into the Cleveland Browns is by cycling coaches nonstop. And, you know, you have to have some stability first and process gets built on stability, decision-making good decision-making happens when you have a stable base to work from. And, you know, once that stability is achieved, then you can say, okay, we have the lay of the land. We have a stable structure in place. This needs to be changed. That needs to be changed. And this needs to be changed. And then you can address them. But if you are on uncertain, uh, you know, uneven ground or you're in the middle of a storm, that's not time to change uh, captains. It's not time to change, uh, you know, radical major shifts because the problems that are there during a storm may not necessarily be there when the weather's good. So, you know, it's, you know, there's, there's talent here. There's, I think a process is in place. A lot of people wanted Seattle, you know, like when, when everything was kind of going sideways with, uh, you know, when, when, when Frank was, uh, you know, when Frank was let go and when uh, Heinze came in and was here for a hot minute and then gone, I, you know, if somebody said, hey, look, we're going to adopt Seattle's system and structure, I think a lot of people would have been like, woo, hey, all right, baby, <laughs> now you're cooking. But that doesn't happen overnight. So you have to let you have to let it work a bit. And Garth's here, and he's he's working, and so you know I think there's progress. So you uh, and uh, Coco had a question about Jason, and uh, to remind folks, Jason is still fighting long COVID, and it sucks. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it takes with what he and Jess are doing. Which, by the way, if you haven't had the chance to catch Atlanta soccer tonight over at ninety two nine, the game, and on your favorite podcatchers, I think it's in the off the woodwork section of uh, ninety two nine, the game's uh, podcatcher uh, podcast page, and then on the Odyssey app and things like that. Uh, it takes, and much like it is when we're in game day situations, it, it takes. Basically, all the energy that he can and, uh, you know, and Red Bulls and things like that to do a show. And then it literally it's all of that, all of that energy and adrenaline 
and then you come down. And so with him fighting long COVID as long as he mm -hmm. has, it is still it is still a long slog. Mm -hmm. And right now it's, you know, Jason needs to Jason can focus on what he's doing with Jess with AST. We aren't going anywhere. Uh, which is, we, you know, Nick, we're six weeks away from season seven of the mm -hmm. network, by the way. Ooh. And, but yeah, Jason is still fighting the effects of long COVID and we just want him to, to get better and get well and, you know, to put energies into things like AST and, uh, you know, we've got the, the high school season coming up in 2023. And so there's, there's a lot of things going on and, uh, we want Jason to be as best as he can physically when it comes to all of these things that are, that are going on right now. And we got the season. I mean, training camp starts January 6th for Atlanta United. So, I mean, there's, the corner. yeah, so you've got all of these different things, but the biggest thing is that Jason is still fighting long COVID. It sucks. And we want him to be as healthy as humanly possible. So, yeah. That, and that's something that, you know, it, 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 we're seeing now, I think more and more that people who, who deal with long COVID, uh, I mean, just you know, open Twitter up for five minutes and, you know, search long COVID and see kind of the stuff that people are dealing with. It will absolutely wreck you from an energy perspective. Right. Um, you know, and some people recover very quickly from COVID and some people don't. Um, I can tell you this, and he's going to, he's going to massacre me for saying this, but to watch a man. And, and first and foremost, if, if I never do another SDH show again, Jason, John, and Jared are my friends, mm -hmm. right? And we love, yeah. we love and each other very much. That's yeah. It's, it's a family, it's a family deal. And I, I get very protective of family. And, and so to watch Jason down Red Bull after Red Bull and go and do a live event somewhere. You know, or go and help open, uh, a, you know, a, a, you know, one of these uh, station soccer deals, mm -hmm. and then talk about afterwards how exhausted he is, and then you know go and do a live show at night. You know, the man's got to protect where his bread and butter is. Mm -hmm. You know, he's got to protect where his money comes from, and so I think is you know, I would love to have. Uh, you know, the full compliment back. I'm, I'm here on, on this, uh, able to do this, these in the mornings because I'm currently job hunting, um, you know, because my bread and butter is, is out in, you know, the world currently contract video work. <laughs> but, you know, th this is the work that, that John and Jason have put into this show and Jarrett for the number of years that they have is absurd. And, and so, it, and it's exhausting. It really is. It, it's, 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 to, to come in prepared and say, okay, here's our notes. Here's what we're going to cover. Here's how we're going to cover it. Um, you know, it's, it's not a fly by night operation for sure. And so, you know, I, everyone who's, who's kind of given the positive vibes for Jason uh, in, in his recovery from COVID, you know, it's, it's appreciated, but I mean, for the, to get COVID and then immediately be back on the road again. Yeah. I mean, good Lord, that's exhausting, man. Mm -hmm. It's exhausting. And, I'm and, telling you. and he's the biggest thing is that Jason's got to look out for number one. Yeah, he's got to. And that means that means a couple of different things, but at the same time, he has to be as healthy as humanly possible so he can continue to be the the force in soccer that he is. And I I don't use I don't use that lightly. That that Jason is really one of the touchstones of the sport period not just in the southeast but period and he needs to you know it's a hundred percent that you know jason look out for number one like i said we ain't going nowhere soccer's morning show is going nowhere we are here at 905 on turner time every morning and we're ready to talk about the world tournament we're ready to talk you know, notice i didn't say uh, the C word with it. And I didn't mm. mention that the home country it is mm. the world tournament, the world soccer review, mm -hmm. everything doing with lower divisions, everything going on with Atlanta United, major league soccer, super draft is coming up like next week. Uh, all those kinds of things, you know, we ain't going nowhere because uh, as your, as your network of, of network of record and morning show of choice, 
uh, it, it's been it's been a blast building it the way that we have. We ain't done. We got a lot to do, but biggest thing is just make sure that we're all okay. And uh, so that, that's the the long answer to a short question, Joe. So um, a couple of other things, and I know that Jarrett wanted to come back in at some point because the real world's getting in the way with Jarrett this morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to get uh, I wanted to get Jarrett's political perspective on Morocco and mm. uh, France because that's got some uh, heavy political overtones uh, when it comes to, to what you're staring at. But uh, uh, other thing. Oh, oh, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. OK, well, the TV deal came out yesterday. Uh, All right. And uh, briefly, uh, the TV deal came out and it's the the linear element of it. Four-year linear broadcast agreements with Fox, no ESPN. If we also, and this is why we, you know, this is why we need an afternoon drive show because this broke yesterday afternoon, and the first time that we get to address it is today. Uh, Fox Sports, Televisa Univision, TSN, and RDS in Canada. We caught up with JJ Adams to kind of get the Canadian perspective on it yesterday. If you missed that conversation, it's on the network. Uh, Fox, FS1, Fox Deportes will have exclusive linear broadcast rights in English and Spanish to an average of 34 regular season games, eight postseason games in the next four years. Unimas, Univision to the NA, they are doing select league leagues cup matches, MLS and Liga MX uh, joint venture. Uh, that uh, So they've got leagues cup. Mm -hmm. Canada, TSN and RDS get the extensive schedule of regular season matches according to the release. One match a week featuring a Canadian club, J.J. Adams, who lives in Vancouver, admitted he was thrilled that he'll be able to see Toronto FC pretty much for that game of the week all the time. Uh, networks will broadcast 23 Leagues Cup encounters in the mix. But the biggest news that came out of the, the linear deal is that no ESPN, no ESPN Deportes, it is Fox, FS1, and Fox Deportes. That was the biggest, I think, news peg out of the linear deal that got announced yesterday. I think it's going to be interesting to see if, uh, you know, with through the plus, if they continue to dive in on USL, uh, it, because they it opened uh, obviously much smaller DMAs, but it, the width and breadth of USL allows you to have a significant reach mm -hmm. and really tap into a market that's rabid about what they care about. Then uh, you know it, it allows you an opportunity to really serve a a, a, a segment of the sport that you know. The, it could be exciting and it could be fun as open cup really, you know, showcased this past year. I'm, I'm very curious about how ESPN will cover MLS going forward. Um, they have been sort of notorious in the past for, if we don't have the rights, we're not really going to do a bunch of deep dives on it. So it, it, it will be interesting to see how, that goes as, as far as, and yeah, Sean, as far as, uh, well, I appreciate that, Sean. Thank you. I, you're a good man. Uh, um, if, if with Taylor having to leave ESPN, if you know, I, it, it, Sean's opinion it, on that, I, I don't wish unemployment on anyone. Yeah, I really don't. <laughs> it's a pain, but I will say that I, I, you know, Taylor's brand of, uh, commentary has sort of rubbed me a bit raw as of late I, the, I, the, the vitriol the elevated vocal uh, intonations yeah it's like it's non-stop it's like it's like monday night raw yeah uh in the in the most recent mcmahon era uh, on promos where everything is like hyper scripted like you can't do scripted rant no scripted rant does not work it, it it's it's paper mache it's easily busted through it's yeah it's, yeah, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's to me, it just doesn't it doesn't work. And I'm over it. I'm over the Carnival Barker, you know, soccer commentary. It, it I, I'm just done with it. And so for Taylor, as we've discussed in the past, I think he had one great, amazing moment of honesty and, and, and pain and honesty on camera. And somebody said, Taylor, you need to do more of that. Mm -hmm. Because that really resonated. Our clicks, our views, our metrics are through the roof. Please continue to do that. Uh -huh. And he said, yep, can do. And he, he hasn't really left it. But you can't keep the same character. 
you, you, you sometimes have to go face. You sometimes have to go heel. Sometimes Very you... few individuals can go through an entire career sticking to one side of the aisle. Right, exactly. And so it, you have to change it up, you know? Don't and I think we have a lot of people who are afraid to be the normal, like the the straight man. Uh, you know, everybody wants to be the foil, but you can't be the foil to the foil. Yeah, you know, you have to be the straight. That somebody that's, has to be that's the straight. Matter, that's matter and antimatter when you do that. Right. You you have to have the straight person who says, "Hey, look, this is the facts. This is what you know." A non-explosive, non-hot take thing, and then you have somebody who's a bit more animated. That traditionally has worked. But it seems that right now everyone who's being employed is the is the the hot take foil, and, and I think that's why we're getting a lot of the, you know, the the cycle of of uh, of carnival barker that we're getting. Mm-hmm. So it, it's and I, I really dislike the, you know, the the sort of putting down of American soccer that we've seen. Where it's like, oh well, it's clearly not, uh, you know, Champions. Don't talk down. If you're, if don't bury your sport, don't bury your coverage. You have to, you know, it, build the pop, build the energy. You know, you don't have to. And not everyone's asking you to be, uh, you know, prime Barcelona. There are plenty of leagues out there that, where the 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 ambassadors of the sport love it they embrace it they en- actually enjoy conversating most of the people now seem like they couldn't be bothered like oh they dragged me out of the hotel they dragged me away from food from from you know the dinner service to the room service to come out and talk about this game i can't believe i have to do it, it, it and everyone enjoys being rage merchants mm-hmm. you know and, and I, I i'm sorry i want have people who can discuss facts who can discuss history Put things into perspective. Add context to things. Flesh things out, and make it enjoyable. I, I, I'm I'm sorry. I want to see something different. I, I really I, I hunger for something, a, a higher grade of meal than what we've been getting. I'm tired of paying four star prices and getting uh you know a ramshackle meal. I'm tired of it. Well, you know, there's a you know there's a a, a network that. Uh... That you that you know that you know intimately that kind of likes to to build out topics and spend time and go do deep dives and things like that and have honest and earnest conversation. So uh, it, it's it, you risk turning and what you really do is you while you may bring in newer folks under the tent, the ones who've been there the longest, you may end up repelling by by going to that carnival barker mentality you know that's the that's that is that is the inherent risk in that but if you if but if you as a network entity feel comfortable enough in your product and your ratings and your reach that you have to feel like you have to have somebody like that then that's on you but i think that you risk turning more people away than you do bringing people in when all you have people doing is yelling and being ill-informed about what's going on in front of them and it's it's a dangerous game to play and uh david who is uh who's in this morning he says uh so his mentality is similar to yours nick like intelligence and thought versus theatrics but i must be in the minority based on who espn continues to retain versus send packing when it comes to that and uh, Michael had a hate to see ESPN, but less focus on MLS. Even the coverage they have is sometimes condescending. Yeah, it is. It, it is. And I, I go back to Thomas Rongan, you know, with, you know, when, when he was with BN and he was saying that, uh, you know, he was, he was clowning on Messi and I, I was having a discussion uh, with Biscuit's dad on, um, on Twitter earlier today about this, that, you know, when Rongan decided to be the hot, the ultimate hot take artist and, you know, talk about how, you know, Messi can't thrive outside of Barcelona's system, you know, and that's what I'm talking about. There's no curiosity in that statement that, that Rongen made at that time. There's no curiosity. There's no, you know, let's look historically at how great players who have moved have fared elsewhere. How did Johan Cruyff fare when he left the, uh, the bosom of Ajax and, you know, went abroad? That's, you know, and then when, if you go on YouTube, there's a, a Dutch show 
obviously an old show that had some soccer, uh, you know, minds sitting around a whiteboard. And Johan Cruyff got up and discussed his vision of the 3-4-3. And you could see where the managers all went from, you know, sitting back and kind of like, <laughs> to when he started explaining the why, everyone leans forward. And mm-hmm. they're interested and they're listening. And they are, and and it's something that, I, I would be a North Korean astronaut before... I think I'll ever see that on American television where you have people just sitting around outside of our wonderful beloved network and uh, someone of the reach of an ESPN or a Fox have some soccer minds sit around and be like and whiteboard stuff Mm -hmm. showcase like show if you have this knowledge showcase it you know. And, and here's why we do this. And, and here's why, you know, when they moved here and they did here, this is what, you know, what they were trying to do. And, and, and the Manning cast, I think, is a great shout out. You know, I think if you had somebody like a Jeff Lorenowitz on there or if, you know, you know, or, or Deuce or somebody else who could, you know, you know, have some great stories to tell. I think that's something that would really work. But you have to have programmers and producers and people who you know, control the purse strings, the comptrollers who say, yes, we're willing to take a risk on a show like this. And it will take a soccer audience buying in and saying, yes, even if there are some rough spots in the beginning, it's our show. We're going to own it and embrace it. So I, you know, and yes, RIP Mike Leach. I mean, you know, I I was thinking today, watching some of uh, the clips that we've seen, you know, who would be, you know, soccer's Mike Leach. I think it, I mean, Schmetzer seems to me like a guy who would be like a Mike Leach, like somebody who probably has like, you, w- you wouldn't look, look, look at him and think he would have these really crazy, funny stories. Yeah. But I think Schmetzer probably would. Uh, and I think Gio Savarese probably would as well. Mm-hmm. But I just, I, I want something better and elevated. And I don't think that I'm a nerd for asking for that. I don't think I'm a dweeb for asking for a more elevated product from the people who like, if you gave me Alexi Lawless that I've met several times in person over the Alexi Lawless that's up there cutting promos, uh, you know, during the, the world's largest sporting event. Yes. I, that, I, that would pay good money for that. I, I, I turn off the, what I see. I reject what I see from Fox uh, on, on the coverage that they've put forward because it is, it, it, you know, I feel like I, I'm, you know, I'm watching the movie network and, you know, and, and it's, it, it we're oh, seeing know. some, you know, like I'm as mad as hell, you know, and they're like, Oh, well, yeah. we're going to make a dollar off of this. Uh-huh. And, and I think that's where we are right now. And it's, we have to get away from that. Entertainment yeah. is, is, is prevalent. It's everywhere. You know, it's, but it's the same thing as, you know, whenever everybody wanted black and red fish, right? Everybody wanted black and red fish, you know, the Creole cooking. I want black and red fish. I want black and red. Oh my God. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now it's time to switch it up. Right. Give me something that's completely different than what, you know, everyone else is offering. Give me something that, you know, what's the, the, you know, it doesn't have to be someone who's extraordinarily well-established. Give me something that's, uh, you know, that a, a food truck is making, right? That's that's really changing the game. Give me something that some ramen joint hole in the wall is, you know, is out there just changing the game. Ooh, it's, ramen. It's the same thing with commentary. It doesn't have to be someone who's played internationally for 15 years and then played at a high league level for God knows how long. Give me somebody who's like some random USL coach. Give me some Division three coach give me somebody who just has creative views of the game who has the stones to share it right give me uh you know get manya mccoskey out of george mason and put her on tv and have her discuss her views of the game and 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 the the pyramid itself right she has some fantastic views on that put her out there to let her see how it's going you know give me uh you know get Landon Donovan, not to talk about it from a former LA Galaxy man, but get him to talk about it as an executive. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. 
it's, considering where that's where he is now, he's he is upstairs with San Diego Loyal. He is not uh, right. Yeah, he he's not downstairs anymore. Right, and so you know, have people like the Van Tassels on to talk about, and they uh, were on Bloomberg Radio yesterday. Exactly, and they're in Statesboro, right? Mm-hmm. I don't need a pipeline of people from Chicago uh, or people who you know played uh who wore u.s jerseys who were probably part of one of the most toxic locker rooms on earth uh trying to explain to me what soccer is i i don't need that give me someone who has the stones to share their view now this is what my view of the six is this is what my view of the eight is this is what my view of wing play is and educate us you know uh, Break our minds, mm-hmm. you know, like, like it's the same when Ralph Rangnick first started talking about uh, gegen pressing, you know, people laughed and laughed and laughed. And then, you know, when he took a third division team to the, the top flight, everybody's like, whoa, wait a minute, mm-hmm. you know, break our brains, show us something new. I, I, I apparently it is too much to ask. Because like the whole thing of this is a, the, the way it has to be, and this hurts is my a, the, ears. That hurts you know. my ears, man. I, I, it, yeah, it's just it's annoying. My God in heaven. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, yeah, we're in a different place now. Look, it, it, American football audiences, you know, went from being able to talk about you know just basic rivalry stuff to understanding the intricacies of the air raid because people were willing to step up and discuss it you know coach paul johnson no matter what you think about him had no problems getting in front of a whiteboard and diagramming his version of the triple option and explaining why he runs it right Mm -hmm. break our brains expand make us but that takes courage because people will laugh at you in the beginning and but have the courage to stand up there and explain things and Jesse Marsh, he does it. He explains his version of uh, his, he'll, he'll talk to anybody with a microphone and a camera. You know, it's the same thing. Break our brains, baby. Show us something new. And speaking of breaking our brains, we got a game to talk about today. Uh, and this is and now that Jared is back in uh, France and Morocco, two o'clock. The, the France number has grown to a minus 185 in the composite, courtesy of our friends at Odds Portal. Uh, 90 minute draws a plus 293. I like that number. And Morocco, Morocco to win in 90 minutes is a plus 642. Uh, Jarrett, I know that uh, you being part of uh, geopolitic down here, uh, the, the background of Morocco. We've got both representatives here today. <laughs> that's what I'm saying, brother. France and Morocco, geopolitic down here. Start us off for those that may not know. Uh, the, uh, and, uh, and Nick can back me up on this. Um, uh, Morocco is attempting a move through Western Europe to, like, faster than the Romans ever dreamt of moving. It took the Romans 200 years to get through the Iberian Peninsula. It took Morocco a week. On top of that, uh, they're going to move up into France, which is uh, Gaulic <laughs> original Celtic territory, like talking Julius Caesar, Vercingetorix, like one of the most infamous battles of all time where Caesar was sieging, uh, putting a town under siege and then a, a support army showed up, and Caesar's plan was, we'll just build another wall to encap- encase ourselves and fight on two fronts. And it worked. Um, but Morocco is about to try and do what, what took the Romans hundreds of years, and they're trying to do it in like three weeks. Um, uh, there is a lot of influence, uh, uh, French influence, in, in what is now Morocco, the Kingdom of Morocco. Um, there will be tensions. Uh, there is also the fact that there is a French team that is, frankly, not good at defending. Nope. France can light you up. They can also get really sideways defensively. I want to see how it goes. Nick, what are your thoughts on the geopolitical battle at hand? Uh, hey, look, you know, the uh, the Moors, uh, you know, my family crest um, out of Sicily is a black elephant under a uh, bright red sun. Uh, so I'm a big proponent of uh, the war elephant game and uh, North Africans invading, uh, you know, and conquering Europe. So uh, I'm, I'm 100% Team Morocco today. Um, I've been Team Morocco this whole tournament, so no reason to switch that up now. Correct, Morocco man. Uh, Morocco man. Uh, you know, is it? It's a, uh, is the tag visible? 
That's my okay. question. I have to figure out how to do that because I'm learning the technology, but I haven't figured out the entire technology. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why the lower third isn't showing up, and I'm annoyed. All right. If you were able to see my lower third, it clearly says Morocco Man in all caps. It does, absolutely. Um, so the question is, is can Morocco overcome, uh, you know, the injuries and red cards that were <laughs> distributed? Yeah. And um, All 74 of them. You know, but, but the, the thing that I – love is that the story of this tournament what they've been able to do for uh for the continent of africa and helping to get more teams into the next tournament via breaking of the glass ceiling for them that you know they they've discussed their investment uh the, how the king and, and yeah that's fine that's fine you can say five nil everybody been saying that morocco is going to get spiked on and all that mess uh i, I i'm whether we succeed or whether we fail, I am Team Morocco all day. So I'm riding with them nonstop. So my Atlas Lions, we're going to see what's going to happen with them. But what they've been able to do this tournament is storybook in itself. The way that they were able to build their national team program up with proper investment uh, is a storybook in itself. And so yeah, I, I have no problem with one more uh, North African charge, uh, into, uh, into continental Europe. Let's, let, let's, let's make it happen. Let's get it done. And let's see if we can hold some territory this time. There you go. Uh, morning, Abby. And, uh, thanks as always for the, uh, subscribing and subscriptions. Uh, Jared, what kind of a game are you anticipating with, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, Morocco France, uh, numbers today? <laughs> um, I'm honestly expecting to see like another tight game, not unlike what we saw with, like, I'm curious if we get a similar situation where like, remember how Croatia held the Brazilians in check mm -hmm. and then Brazil just kind of got, we talked about this in the lead up to, with, with Bart in the lead up to the Argentina game. Um, Argentina was a – it didn't end up mattering because Argentina scored early and damn near put that game away before halftime. Um, effectively did put it away by halftime. But if the game got tight late, we felt more comfortable with Argentina in a tight late game where they were struggling to find a goal than we did Brazil. Right. Where does France fit into this pile? Because is France a team that if it's tight late, are they going to get a little loose in the screws in the head? Or are they going to be able to – say okay we can stay calm we've got the attack let's just play our game if it takes us 120 minutes to break it down it might take 110 minutes and we have to hold on for 10 minutes but you but i want to see if they can handle if this game gets 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 tight and they can't break through you know can they stick to the plan or does someone get sideways and get a little loose coming out of turn four and then all of a sudden boom you're getting hit on a counter and Morocco can't hit you on the counter, and France does have a bad defense. Mm -hmm. I expect it to be tight. Saying that, and I, I, I'm sorry, Nick. I think France ends up winning it. Um, what I think happens eventually is you get that moment of brilliance from a guy like Mbappe, or the ball falls kindly to Giroud and he doesn't make a mistake because that's what he's been this tournament so far. Is he's just he's been there to in the right place at the right time to get it right. I Part of me wonders if it ends up like a 3-1 kind of game that does not tell the whole story. Like, if you told me it's like 3-1 and said, hey, Morocco played their ass off for 75 minutes and they just ran out of gas and they gave up, you know, it's like 2-1 and they give up one chasing. Yeah. Uh, and, they, and they have to come out and play hard and, and, you know, play open and France gets another one, that sort of thing, where the score line doesn't tell you the whole story. I fully expect Morocco to put a effort win, lose, or draw that is something that the entire continent and the entire uh, Islamic world can be proud of. All right. So uh, he says 3-1 chasing. Tell you what, I'll go, I'll go, uh, I'll go game chaos here. I'll go 2-1 Morocco, and it takes an extra 30 to get there. Off of a... Off of that a, is some sickos energy. I love it. 
Sickos committee, brother. Yeah, see now, and you got to keep an eye on our friends at the Sickos committee to see how that well they're engaged in the match today. So, look, I got enough problems in my life trying to teach the Sickos committee about lower level Argentine football. Um, mm-hmm. I, I introduced the Sickos committee to Clapole and their their fabled game where they got like um, seventy two reds. Yeah, well, well, it was I think it was twenty two reds in the game. Yeah. Um, yeah. Everybody on both teams got red cards it was you're out you're out every everyone is out of this game (laughs) and that Um, was awesome it was and i'm happy to always introduce people to the fact that that is a thing so all right sorry sean hang on just a second sean says i basically picked the draw shocker well i mean on on according to the sheet you did yeah 90 minute draw i did that is a draw. I, I did pick a 90 minute draw, but I picked He's a win. Wrong. I picked an eventual winner though. I didn't just sit there and say that, you know. Well, you have to pick a winner today. Yeah, you, they, they can't draw. They this can't, isn't a, they, this yeah. isn't the FA Cup. They can't do a replay. I, I hope everyone has fun. We can't have that. We have to, you know, we got to have a, a, a an outcome at the end. Yeah. And then of course Sean, who's going full friends, an Mbappe hat trick and two for Giroud and others. So uh, Sean, Sean is picking, uh, absolute, uh, uh, Sean, Sean is picking absolute French domination today in the match against Morocco. I don't see that. I think that, uh, and, and if, uh, you know, I, I just think it's going to take a while. So there you go. So it's going to take 120, but I think that Morocco gets the Duke and, and I'm getting, I'm getting really stupid here. I'm going to say two, one, two, one Morocco. Oh, you're going with that plus six. Uh, you're going with that plus six forty, aren't you? I'm going. I'm going two one Morocco, and uh, I, but I think France scores stupid early. Uh huh. I think France scores stupid early. See you, and, Jeff. and it has all the energy of a blowout. But I, I'm saying two one Morocco. Yeah, it's uh, and David says Bud Selig would like a word, Nick. Yeah, Bud Selig <laughs> can eat these hands. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime old Bud's ready. Yep. I'll let him, uh, he could throw first. Uh, soccer for good OG is predicting Bedlam. Abby is predicting that defense will win the game. Uh, she thinks Morocco wins by one and with the defense that's there. Uh, so very, very cool stuff there. Keep your predictions coming in for the remainder of the, of the program. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to get in before we, we signed off this morning and I want to get the story. So it's from our friends at Business Insider, Jack Newsom. And uh, Jack was very, very busy in one of his exclusives. Headline, D.C. United owner Jason Levy and accused by MLS team's former top lawyer of dodging millions in taxes. Article is uh, okay so jason levy and co-owner of washington dc's uh, mls team and an investor in pro sports teams in the uk and australia has been accused by his company's former top lawyer of cheating on his taxes levy and lied to new york officials this is from business insider levy and lied to new york officials by claiming to live in florida for years to avoid two and a half million to 5.2 million in city and state taxes according to a recently unsealed complaint obtained by insider the lawsuit was brought by Christopher Dubert, who until last year was the top lawyer for Levy and D.C. United. The case brought under New York's False Claims Act was filed last year under seal, recently unsealed after the state attorney general declined to intervene in the case. A whistleblower can keep pursuing a case even if the state passes on it, however, and is entitled to share to a share of whatever is recovered. Levy and born and bred in Manhattan, this is quotes, uh, has maintained his principal residence in Manhattan for nearly all his life until recently moving to Washington, D.C. full-time. The complaint says it says he made an estimated 2 to $4 million a year. The complaint also indicates Dubert has filed a similar whistleblower case in Washington, D.C., alleging that there is considerable evidence, end quote, including public records and media interviews that shows Levian has never lived in Florida and claims Levian's account told, accountant told Dubert that Levian uses his parents' residence, a Boca Raton condo, for tax purposes. So there you go. So we'll keep an eye on that whistleblower case. And then there was the other, uh, there was the other story that I wanted to get in. Uh, let's see. And it was one that I posted this morning 
and Nick, and it has to do with Syria. So obviously, uh, oh man, yeah. So here we go. And, and uh, according to Agence France Press, uh, here is here's the headline. Berlusconi promises Monza players, quote, busload of hookers, end quote, if they beat big guns. Fr- from Milan, Monza owner Silvio Berlusconi said he has promised his players a busload, in quotation marks, of prostitutes if they win one of their upcoming clashes with Serie A's leading lights, including his old club AC Milan. Speaking at a Christmas dinner on Tuesday night in front of sponsors and a player's delegation, the former Italian prime minister joked, that he wanted to give his players, quote, extra encouragement, end quote, ahead of the second half of the Serie A season, which begins on January 4. Monza face Juventus in both league and cup and Inter Milan next month as they restart their first ever season in Italy's top flight with the visit of the champions Milan coming in mid-February. Quote, I told them that coming up we have Juventus, Milan, etc., and that if they manage to beat one of those great teams, I'll send a busload of hookers to the dressing room, end quote. Berlusconi said in a speech, which was greeted with laughter and later posted on social media. He ain't joking. (laughs) They may say he was joking. Silvio may say he was joking. He's Mm. not joking. (laughs) I'm just letting you know. He's 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 not he's not kidding. No, he's not. Okay. No, no. He will triple verify. uh, You know uh, the origin of of uh, said workers and uh, you know ages and whatnot but he ain't kidding okay he, 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 I'm, I'm just saying i'm no you know <laughs> he, he's no. not playing around he, okay. he means it okay uh but you know I, I saw that this morning and i was like yeah i probably should uh i probably should bring that one to the table toward the end of the show this morning just well, to- he has to say it's a joke because oh since yeah they posted on social media there's some players who are like yo man my wife is gonna kill me if you don't uh-huh. say you're kidding yes <laughs> so he has to say oh yes it's a joke he said no problem you know mm-hmm. that, yeah he, he ain't joking Mm-mm. well <laughs> he, he said he was joking wink wink nudge nudge how you doing how you doing uh, so we have uh, uh, Lionel Messi saying he's very happy. His last World Cup game is a final. And uh, great great article from our friends at Sky. Messi signed for Barca on a napkin 22 years ago. So we've got, uh, we've got that. We've got a plenty of gossip, rumor, and innuendo that we can get into. Uh, but uh, Jarrett Smith, uh, before we go this morning, parting shot, sir. Um. Hey man, enjoy uh, enjoy whatever the hell is about to happen this afternoon. Um, I still think it'll be a fun game. I don't think France like walks over Morocco. They've come too far. They fought too hard. They have done too much in the name of really a lot of different groups to 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 lay down on this. Um, I think they'll put up a good fight. Do they win? I don't know. Um, if they win it one nothing, I'll die laughing. Like if they manage to stifle France's attack. And like steal a goal, I will mm. die laughing. But France also doesn't. France doesn't have necessarily like that black hole ru- uh, ruiner of offenses that is a Cristiano Ronaldo like <laughs> Portugal had. They actually have even veteran players who are who who at least know how to work in the system. I think that'll matter. Now, can Morocco do it? Yeah, because any every time we thought Morocco can't do it, they do. So at a certain point, you just look at it and go, "Yep, <laughs> they're going to be a problem." Well, I I think that France is going to, you know, their long attacks are going to be. I think they can be blunted by this Moroccan defense. You're not the passing lanes are going to be cut off. They're going to have to play in a phone booth to to beat Morocco. And they're going to have to take stupid comedic shots from way outside. Um, they can do it. They have the weapons to do it. France does, but that's Bono, the- Bono has been uh, on his on. You know, he's been one of those great keepers that we've seen in this tournament as well. Correct, correct. So I, I do think that they are going to. Um, I, I do think it's going to come down to France being able to play and. Uh, in a phone booth and take long comedic shots. The, the long lengthy runs, I don't think are going to happen uh, with as much frequency 
And I think France has feasted on those, but there have been times when they're not able to do that, that they look very beatable. And so that's why I'm, I'm saying my boys. Yeah, Morocco's, you're not really going to get an opportunity. Like you're not going to get nearly as many counter opportunities where France can stretch their legs and get creative and get dynamic. When you're playing a team like Morocco, who is Morocco, it's like, they're not, they're not, they're not 2004 Greece. Mm-mm. No, like 2004 no. Greece had zero interest in playing the sport. Yep, that is true. Correct. Like Morocco's defensive, but they're going to come. They they're, the line of confrontation is not the edge of their 18. They will come out and 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 not. They're not going to let you walk it into the goal, and then put up a put up a fence around the net. They'll come out and meet you, but. They want to do it on their terms, and they can catch you in a bit of a in a in a between a rock and a hard place. Mm-hmm. And the the families are there with the Moroccan players, right? So it's not like they're, you know, they, the families are there with them at the hotel. So it, it's not a matter of, you know, that it's a grounded team. I think that plays a role. Um, you know, when you have to deal with your wife and your kids and you know your significant others or whatever, uh, it helps ground you, right? And, and so I think that plays a role, I think, tactically, uh, how Morocco sets up their defense and the cleanliness in which they've played with this tournament so far, so far, right? um, if they can execute their ability to close down passing lanes, starting at midfield, and then continue their process of cycling out. Uh, they they could they could do something really magnificent today. Uh, also on the board before we go from Cesar Luis Merlo, Maxi Morales is uh, one step uh, closer to returning to Rossing. Advanced with the institution uh, has a renewal clause in 2023. He's not going to execute it. Is waiting to sign uh, to go back to Rossing. And also on the board, FIFA has turned down a request. Uh, to expand rosters in the uh, 2023 Women's World Cup from 23 to 26. Uh, uh, Voss Tecklenburg, the, uh, the head coach of the German uh, Germany team, uh, was the one who told uh, everybody basically that FIFA said no. And FIFA said it would only be more of an advantage to the, the deeper countries if they expanded from 23 to 26. So uh, it's going to be 23, 23 player rosters for the women's world cup right now uh, for Australia and New Zealand coming up later on in the year. Uh, guys, that was a wall pass Wednesday. That was pretty solid. That was. I mean, it's, it's time. us, but we'll see uh, what happens. Yeah. So uh, two o'clock on your network of choice. It is uh, Morocco and friends. And we'll see what happens there. So, uh, Nick, since it is the end of a show, go ahead and send us home. Well, until next time, ladies and gentlemen, please be kind to each other. Do not engage with rage merchants on social media. And uh, and Forza Atlas Lions, until next time, mucha mucha Euro Yule.